In this week's experiment, we're going to start looking at equilibrium. There are three parts to this experiment. The first part involves just kind of figuring out what's happening in the experiment. The second part is going to give us a tool that we can use to analyze concentrations at equilibrium. And then the third part, we're actually going to mix up a bunch of equilibrium solutions and make some determinations about exactly what's happening in that equilibrium. So to get things started, we're going to look at, as the title of the experiment suggests, we're going to look at the reaction of iron 3 nitrate with potassium thiocyanate. Now, I'm not going to do that experiment. I'm not going to show you that experiment here because, well, the first part of, of the lab is figuring out what's going on. So it's important for you to come at it with fresh eyes and take a look at what happens when you mix these things together. But what we're going to do in that first part of the experiment is try to determine what parts of these reactants are actually causing our reaction to occur. So in order to do that, we really need to think about this more as an ionic type of equation. Because when we've got iron 3 nitrate aqueous, there aren't little iron nitrate units floating around in solution. There are iron ions and there are nitrate ions. So let's expand this out into a more ionic looking equation. We've got iron 3 plus ions in solution. We've got nitrate ions in solution. We've got potassium ions in solution. And we've got thiocyanate. Thiocyanate is one of those polyatomic ions. We may not have come across it before, but we're going to use it a few times. So thiocyanate is a single polyatomic ion. When you mix these together, a reaction is going to occur. But we need to figure out what's causing that reaction to occur. We want to look at these four components that we have available and decide which of them is really required and which of them are spectator ions. Because, well, spectator ions really aren't that important. So in the lab, there will be a couple of different salts around the room. So after you do your first experiment where you just look at what this looks like when you mix it together, the next step in that first section is going to be looking at some different salts and deciding which of these ions is responsible for the reaction you observe based on these other experiments that you do. So just to try to get us all going on that part, let's think about that. In terms of well, let's think about potassium. Are potassium ions really necessary for this reaction to occur? How might you test that? Well, somewhere in the lab, you'll be able to find another thiocyanate salt. Maybe you'll be able to find sodium thiocyanate. So, what happens if instead of using potassium thiocyanate as your reactant, you use sodium thiocyanate. It's not going to change the thiocyanate, but it will change the potassium to sodium. If you mix these two together and you get the same reaction to occur, well that's a pretty good indication that potassium isn't critical because you can substitute it for sodium. If you mix these together and you don't get the same reaction to occur, well that tells you that the potassium must have been important because when you remove it and replace it with sodium, the reaction no longer occurs. So that's the first portion of the experiment. Using the salts that are available, look at substitutions of different ions until you can decide what part of this reaction is really crucial to 
the reaction that you observe. Once we do that, the next step in this process is going to be to determine the Beer's Law constant for the product that you make so that we can use that Beer's Law constant later on. Now, for those of you who are paying attention to what's going on, if you're determining a Beer's Law constant, what do you think we're going to be observing when a reaction occurs? Beer's Law, absorbance, colored solutions, you're probably going to be observing a color forming here. So, what about Beer's Law? Remember, we've got Beer's Law, absorbance is equal to ELC. We're going to start out by making up some solutions of known concentration so that we can determine the value of EL. Now, we said this was an equilibrium. So, how do we make up solutions of known concentrations if we're in equilibrium? Because equilibrium tells us that we can't have 100% one way or another. Well, we can't have 100%, but we can probably get close enough that within the error of the experiment, we'll get 100% almost. So the way we can do that is by using something called Le Chatelier's principle. And Le Chatelier's principle tells us that if we stress an equilibrium, the equilibrium will shift to relieve that stress. What does that mean? Well, in this case, it means that we're going to prepare a number of different solutions where we're using a relatively high concentration of one of the reactants and if you work it out, it's going to be a relatively high concentration of iron solution. And that high concentration of iron solution is going to force this equilibrium so far to the product side that for our purposes, we can think of it as being 100% complete. So you're going to prepare a few samples of known concentration and you're going to measure the absorbance of those samples. Now a lot of times when we use Beer's Law we, we make solutions of different concentrations and we fit it to a line and we get our value of EL from the slope. We're going to be using this a little bit differently today. We're going to make up a number of solutions of the exact same known concentration and just mathematically solving for EL. That way we can treat it just as an average. And averages are probably easier for us to think about error and consider error. So once you prepare a number of samples and the number you prepare is up to you, you need to have at least two, but depending how much you trust those samples, you can always do three or four because you're going to use those samples to calculate a value of EL, and the rest of your experiment depends on how good your value of EL is. So I would prepare enough samples so that you've got pretty good confidence in your value of EL. So that's going to be part two of the experiment, preparing samples so that you can determine Beer's Law, so you can determine the EL value in Beer's Law. Then, in the third part of the experiment, you're going to prepare a number of samples that are less than all the way to completion. So we're going to decrease the amount of iron that we use, because if we decrease the amount of iron, now we're not pushing that reaction so far to products that it goes all the way to completion. So the next part of the experiment, we're going to mix up some more samples using different concentrations of iron nitrate, different volumes of iron nitrate at the same concentration, and combine those with a constant amount of potassium thiocyanate. In that part of the experiment, 
you're going to be using burettes and pipettes to measure out your samples. So make sure you're using both of them correctly and recording the values for both of them correctly. You're going to be using You're going to be using a 5 milliliter pipette to dispense potassium thiocyanate. 5 milliliter pipettes are 5.00 milliliters. They are not just 5. So pipettes, volumetric, deliver a known amount. Make sure that you know what that amount is and you record it properly. Because if you record this as just five, well, that means you've only got one sig fig worth of data. That means that there's a lot more error in there than there really should be. The iron nitrate solution is going to be dispensed with a burette. Because we want to dispense a number of different volumes over a range of volumes. What about those burettes? How do you properly read a burette? If you haven't watched the, the video on volumetric glassware and burettes and pipettes, go back and watch that. It's in the general info area under content in D2L. But what about those burettes? The burettes you're using are going to be 50 milliliter burettes. They'll have graduation marks every tenth of a milliliter, which means that you, as the experimenter, need to estimate another decimal place. So your burette readings should all be to two decimal places. And, probably more importantly, those two decimal places should not all be zero, zero. They shouldn't even be one zero and two zero and three zero over and over again. When you're making up these samples, it's not critical that you use an exact amount of iron nitrate solution. What you need to know is how much solution you've used. So look at your burette and think about it. If you take an initial reading of, let's say, 4.6 eight milliliters and maybe you want to add three milliliters of iron nitrate to your sample so what you want to let that drain until it's a little past three milliliters a little past seven and a half so drain that down and take a final reading maybe you got seven point five three milliliters How much have you dispensed? Well, 3 minus 15, 2.85 milliliters dispensed. That's perfectly fine. As long as you know the volume, it doesn't matter that the volume isn't an exact amount. If you wanted an exact amount, we'd be using a whole bunch of different pipettes. But we don't want to do that. So. Make sure you're using your burettes properly, both for the iron nitrate solution and the water, so that our volumes are approximately 20 milliliters for all these samples. That's pretty much the experiment for this week. So we've got three parts. The first part, determine what's reacting. The second part, use a large excess of iron nitrate solution to push the reaction to completion so that you can determine the Beer's Law constant. The third part, make up a number of samples and measure their absorbance so that you can then calculate equilibrium concentrations. This is a two-week experiment, but pretty much all of the experimental work you should be able to get finished in the first week. That second week, we're going to devote to looking at some of the calculations, give you some time to make sure you understand how those calculations work, and probably talk about a couple of other issues that we all need to do to try to help and improve. So keep that in mind.
Think about your experiment as you're doing it, and we'll see how the first week goes.